have a, speaking of generalizations about libertarians, uh, I have another one in this context I'd like to think about, because I think libertarians are people who have unusually good imaginations. Because in the face of a world that's very different from the one that we would like to see, uh, and in the face of most people not seeing an alternative, people like the people in this room, like us, see a different way the world could be, how it could be even better, and also imagine ways to get there as well. So imagine that you're sitting on the floor watching TV in the mid-1980s. Imagine you're 15 and you're watching on the VCR in your aunt's flat, Rocky IV, for about the seventh time. It's, it's the only tape you've got. <laughs> and maybe you're sitting down, maybe you've got your head propped on your elbows or you're leaning against a beanbag or whatever, but the film is amazing. And you're just getting into that great bit and the fight at the end and, you know, Drago's got the cut on his face and it's really, really exciting. And there's a knock on the door. Bam, bam, bam. And you see a look in your aunt's face that you've never seen before while she's in her own flat. And she tells you to go to her room and wait there. And because where you live, these things can be very serious, you do what she says. But just before you get to her room, you see the two men come in through the front door without waiting, pointing at the TV and the VCR and shouting at her, and then you close the door. And eventually, a few minutes later, you hear the, outdoor, the outside door slam again, and you go out, and the VCR's gone. And that'll be the last time you ever watch uh, a film in your aunt's flat. Now, in Ceausescu's Romania, in the mid-1980s, VCRs were an amazing lifeline for the people who lived there under this sort of great grey dome of information closure. You know, there were a couple of propaganda-ridden TV stations that were very intermittent. There was really nothing else. You didn't see the world outside. It was grey, and it was miserable, and it was what the state told you. But a black market entrepreneur realized that actually you could make the VCR copies of Hollywood movies very cheaply, and actually if you just got one woman to voice all the roles in Romanian, people wouldn't mind as long as they could hear the stories. And actually they got used to it, this one woman who did all these movies for her, every voice in Rocky IV. Uh, and they were incredibly, incredibly popular. And people would gather together in a flat, even though it was dangerous, and they would watch these things. And actually, perhaps because the authorities didn't think it was important enough, perhaps because they themselves and their wives and their children wanted to watch these films, they really didn't close it down, or they couldn't work out how to close it down. So there was this remarkable period when everything else was closed down, but with these films, suddenly something extraordinary started to happen, because these people suddenly saw another world. They saw amazing cars, people who were really happy and doing what they wanted, and beautiful homes, and they saw too a sort of heroism, an attitude to life, that then they could model themselves on. And young men from that period talking about, you know, trying to become Rocky. I'm sure that was true here as well. But you know, there was there was that thing of there was something to live up to, a new vision of what it could be to be a human being and to be heroic and, and to fight for something. And when you got to the revolution, lots of other things going on as well. But you had a generation who had in a way been trained through these entirely silly bits of throwaway Hollywood culture into standing up and fighting and seeing another world that they could go to. In 1810 in America, children's stories were very didactic and were very much about sort of children should be virtuous and they should be quiet and they should be proper and you know, uh, that, that was about it. And then there started to be a change. Over the next 40 years, up to 1850, you saw a huge, huge increase in the stories about inventiveness, about people coming up with original ideas and going out and changing the world and making it better. Uh, it goes up about 66%. There's a graph. Uh, it's on my Twitter. It's very striking. And what's very nice is you can draw another line in the pattern grid, and it has a very nice lag. As those children get older, it goes up when they get to an age when they're going to actually be able to invent things. And then as the stories decline as well, then you see the pattern rate fall as well. Now, 
culture and these things, you know, there's a wider culture going on too. But it's, it's, a, very, it's a very suggestive effect. Stories, novels, changed the world. In 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin, published for the first time in London. It sold 200,000 copies in its first edition. It sold a million copies altogether in the UK. It was the most read novel in the 19th century after the Bible, the most read book. Uh, an enormous effect on the Civil War, on the abolition movement uh, in the US. Francis Bacon's utopian novel, The New Atlantis, uh, inspired the creation of the Royal uh, uh, Society. In Tel Aviv, in Israel, where I was lucky enough to go earlier this year, people don't often realize that it's named for Alt New Land, which is one of the founding texts of Zionism, a novel that dared to imagine what a Jewish homeland could be like in reality to live in and helped inspire reality. Uh, stories change things, but particularly for logical, analytical people who are often, to do another generalization, what libertarians are like, it can be hard to accept that that's the way to convince people. We want, especially if we have data on our side, analysis on, analysis on our side, we, we tend to go there. But, but I've come to the view that it's important to think about what stories, what fiction can do, because they've had enormous effects in the past. And to add a little science to it, for analytical scientific people, there's something called the, uh, get this right, the narrative transportation theory. Um, it's essentially the idea that it's storytelling is a little like mild hypnosis. Lee Child, if you know his, his thrillers, says that there are two kinds of books. There's the book that makes you miss your stop on the bus, and there's the book that doesn't. <laughs> Missing your stop on the bus is like a form of mild hypnosis. You're in a little trance, and you don't see the world outside you anymore. And when you go into that state, you become much more subject to persuasion. And there's, a, there's a large number of studies on that. And also, stories require you to engage with them. You have to complete the images. You have to almost perform it in your mind. I didn't tell you anything about that story in the, the flat in Romania very much. And there's a lot of details to fill in if you engage with it as a story. You have to perform them, so you have to be part of it. And then there are models in these stories, like Rocky, like Jack Reacher, I suppose, whoever it is, that give you someone that you have an emotional reaction to and that you kind of want to be like. And stories are about change. Heroes change in stories. The protagonists of stories are changed by them. That's actually how you construct them. And so as a result, the people that we have an emotional attachment to change, and we have the potential to change too. It's actually the line at the end of Rocky. If I can change, and you can change, then everyone can change. There's a lot uh, in that about how stories really work. The libertarians, of course, should know this. Right? Ayn Rand, it starts with Ayn Rand, even for people who don't, I'm sorry, Simon, we don't all end up as, as objectivists. But, uh, it plays an enormous role. I mean, if you calculated the proportion <coughs> of the movement that comes through uh, two quite old books now, uh, it would be remarkable. And of course, there's Heinlein as well. Uh, Rob was reminding me of Orwell's important novels, 1984, Animal Farm, that can reach a far wider audience than political tracts uh, and close statistical reasoning. <coughs> DARPA, the, the American... Um, yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Is it... Yeah, sure. So DARPA, which is the, the US Defense Research Agency for very advanced weaponry, has a stories uh, project. A uh, chap called, well, they're very interested in how stories affect radicalism and, and Islamism and things like that. Uh, but the chap who was involved with that is uh, William Casebeer. Casebeer, like a case of beer but without the old. Uh, worth looking up. He actually wrote a paper not on defense implications, but on how to engineer stories that could express free market views and why stories might have tended to be uh, against market influences. It's called The Stories Markets Tell. So there's potential there, and we've had some important stories in our own movement, but it, it feels to me like there isn't that much. Now there's the Prometheus Prize for sci-fi. Um, there have been things like Firefly and The Prisoner. They, they're all a while ago, it seems to me. There are, there are people writing uh, in the libertarian style, but, but not too many of them and not, not very well read. Uh, so I think this is something that needs to be, to be thought about. 
again. There is actually, there's a couple of academics in the US, there's Russ Roberts, who uh, has written a couple of novels, and Glenn Whitman, who has written some TV shows, as well as being uh, an economics professor. But they're few and far between. Um, I suppose there are kind of three objections to stories, fiction, as an approach for, for spreading libertarian ideas. One of them is that it's unnecessary, in the sense that there's actually, there is a broad cultural anti-authoritarian movement now. I think if you look at a lot of popular culture, young adult novels in particular, they're, they're quite often about, oh, these terrible state or this, these monstrous authorities that want power over young people, uh, and the rebellion against them. So there's a lot of that. But it seems to me that it's quite thin. It's, it's quite shallow. And there isn't a positive case necessarily being made very often for libertarian values, ideas of what it could be to live in a, in a libertarian way, in, a, in these sorts of heroic ways. Um, you know, and, and you get, as a result, you get things like Trump, which is in many ways an anti-authoritarian, authoritarian movement. So it's sort of, we're against, we're against the authorities, but then we want to you know, use the power of that to do, to do things to benefit us, or that we think will benefit us. And um, of course, there's a lot of cultural activity from other uh, movements, um, in particular, you know, on, on the social justice side, you've got things going on at the Hugos, you've got a new version of Ghostbusters, which has, in its previous incarnation, been, you know, quite a pro-capitalist movie, uh, some of us like to think. So there are plenty of people trying to use stories in ways that we wouldn't necessarily want, which I think is a reason uh, to be active in the space. It's not doing everything that we want it to yet, and there are people who want to take it to places that we don't want it to go. Uh, of course, there's a danger it could be preachy. But that is just to say, if it's bad, it'll be bad, and then it won't work. Uh, yeah, I've got this quote from Ursula Le Guin. The important thing is not to offer any specific hope of betterment, but by offering an imagined but persuasive alternative reality to dislodge my mind, and so the reader's mind, from the lazy, timorous habit of thinking that the way we live now is the only way people can live. And it can be done. Uh, and you know, people think, oh, that's going to be preachy, or it's going to be like that long speech of John Galtz, or something dreadful like that. But it's not. It's about showing the truth that we see about human beings performed in these stories. And it's there in places you don't think it is. Like Wonder Woman, right? Big, big movie coming out next year. Not many people know that Wonder Woman was designed by a psychologist, very specifically to create a hero that he thought didn't exist, that could um, demonstrate female qualities without having to sort of pretend to be a man and sort of just be heroic in the way that men were. Uh, William Moulton Marston. And it, it's, a, it's a popular hero that people can engage with. It doesn't sound like a sermon, and it's not really a sermon. It's just a different idea of what it can be to be human, of what it can be to be heroic. And I think, you know, when people think about Rand, and they think about the long speech of John Galt and the slightly preachy tone of, of, of parts of it, they forget that the real success of Rand is in the characters and the way that they live. I, for me, that's why The Fountainhead is such a powerful book. So you see these characters of Peter Keating as a sort of a terrible way to be and as sort of a dangerous uh, seduction and, and Rourke as an alternative to that. Uh, you know, that, that's what sticks in your mind, is the people. It's no substitute for hard thought and good economic and political reasoning underneath it. But that's not to say it can't complement them. Anthony Jay just died, and I think the, the ability of Yes Minister to explain public choice theory to people who don't know they're having public choice theory explained to them is, is unparalleled. And it shows that very sophisticated ideas as well can be conveyed through that sort of storytelling. Politics is, uh, is downstream of culture. Really what I want to say mainly is just to make people think more about how powerful stories can be in, in if they're trying to talk to people and persuade them. It's much better to say to them, well, here's a story, here's an example, here's an anecdote often than here's a chart, here's why you're wrong, you're an idiot, you're evil, that's a stupid idea. Uh, but it's quite hard to make yourself do that. It's quite counterintuitive because, you know, data is better than anecdotes formally as a proof, but not as persuasion. And it's interesting what's being done out there. Neil Stevenson uh, has the Hieroglyph Project, which is trying to create fiction to inspire Promethean engineering, partly a reaction to 
lots of people in the space program who said that they were inspired by Arthur C. Clarke and you know the early sci-fi period to go and actually build these things to go to space. And he wants to to bring back that. So he's trying to use fiction in that way. And we should think too, what happens if we don't? Because if if stories can have these powerful effects, change people's minds. And if you stand back and don't do anything, and you think about the number of stories about dystopian futures and dreadful apocalypses and how it's all going to hell, how does that change the futures that people try and build and the ways that they think they could live? For myself, because I'm interested in these things, I'm uh, currently trying to experiment with some storytelling, some, some writing for Kindle and publishing, and uh, I think self-publishing is a very easy way in. You can get around gatekeepers and you can experiment with quite short forms and, and unusual things. So that's something I'm working on. I'm uh, getting some beta re readers together at the moment to look at a um, quite short story about uh, 6,000 words that I've uh, done with a friend that's just an example of the things we might do, but I'd be interested in, in people's comments. If, if anyone would like to read something like that, just come and see me and I'll take your email address afterwards. Uh, but I'd like to end just by talking about I started by talking about Romania, and I want to talk about North Korea. And a chap called, I probably am pronouncing this wrong, Kang Chol Hwan. He's head of the North Korean Strategy Center, and he smuggles thumb drives into North Korea loaded with American sitcoms. And he says they are the little red pill in the Matrix. Seinfeld <laughs> revolution. His, his, this is his, his words. When North Koreans watch Desperate Housewives, <laughs> they realize this isn't the enemy. It's what they want for themselves. It cancels out everything they've been told. And when that happens, it starts a revolution in their minds. Thank you. <laughs>